Welcome to the Experts in Sport podcast, brought to you by the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences at Loughborough University. Today I'm with Abdul Faisal Chibza, a high performance specialist at FIFA, and we're going to talk about the African Cup of Nations and the development of football in Africa. But to get us started, we often ask our guests for a brief background on themselves. So can you give us a bit of an insight into your current role uh, with FIFA and what got you to the role in the first place? Thanks, Martin. Happy New Year. Um, excited to be to be with you and, and, and your guest. Congratulations on all the work you guys have done so far. I think it's, it's very important that we you know, continue to have discussions about about this and what you're doing. So congrats on that. Uh, myself, I've just joined FIFA. Um, this is going to be my third year, or I can't believe it's two years already. Um, as one of many high performance specialists that have been contracted uh, to work with Arsene Wenger on the talent development scheme, uh, which is a global project that uh, seems to offer assistance, more of a consultancy uh, type of thing. And we play a role as uh, thinking partners in, uh, in three different areas, really, to support uh, the member associations that have been accepted into this program on uh, long-term strategic planning on how to maximize the potential in every uh, every talent, every country, um, but also give opportunity to as many kids uh, as possible in, in, in every member association that we are working in. Um, it was very clear, you know, when we started that uh, not many kids in, in these countries are getting an opportunity uh, to be observed or to represent their country or to maximize their own potential. Um, so we have been tasked to support these member associations uh, in doing all that and ultimately increasing global competitiveness at FIFA uh, competitions. That's a very good insight. It's going to bring me to I've been I've been searching on FIFA's website and I may get the numbers wrong. So I'm going to jump on it now so I can see. Um, but FIFA are putting a lot of money into the development of football around the world and, and have done for a long time. And I'm looking here and this is one thing on the website it said FIFA are trying to enhance the quality of football throughout the world with the aim of having 50 national teams that are capable of women of competing at the highest level. I, I love the idea that there could be 50 teams that may win the World Cups. Um, I think it's brilliant. I think we'll touch upon it later around the amount of investment that's been going on in Africa and some, some points on just good for context with you mentioning it, that this big development project around the world from FIFA. So what what got you to the role? What's what's your experience? What's your background? So I, uh, I grew up in uh, a West African country called Ghana. I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, and just like many kids, you know, growing up in the streets of Africa, football is all, you know, you know, football is what solves every problem. Um, once you're out on, on the streets, you forget about, you know, the, the daily struggles. Um, so for me, it was the same, you know, and we all wanted to, to play the game, uh, represent our countries. Uh, just a part of that was, was all we wanted to do. Um, so I was no different from, for many kids, you know, in the streets of Africa now, um, until I was privileged to receive a academic scholarship and athletic scholarship to to America um, after I graduated in what we call a secondary school. Um, so I then moved to America, uh, went to a school down in, in Tennessee called Carson Newman for a year. Um, and then from there, I transferred to University of Delaware um, as an NCAA athlete. So I was lucky enough to to receive a first athletic scholarship. Um, and that's where really I, I received my academic and, and sport and education. I uh, was able to graduate with a computer information science degree. And then, you know, continue to to try and explore my options in, in playing the game. So I bounced around in the US and in, in Europe, precisely Sweden for a bit, um, and then decided to just go back into into coaching. Uh, but before that, you know, I wanted to use my, you know, degree in computer science uh, to start making some income and, you know, balance life. 
Um, but after six months, I realized this is not for me. You know, a big part of me was was missing, and that was just being around the game of football. So then I reached out back to my uh, coach at that time in the university uh, to come out and be a volunteer. So I went in just, you know, help picking up cones, you know, ordering pizza, setting up the, the travel arrangement for, for the student athletes. At the same time, I you know, started getting my, my badges, uh, my coaching badges. Um, then an opportunity came up for me to become the second assistant coach at the University of Delaware. So I took that. Um, and sort of worked my way really, you know, uh, got all my badges to my A license. I also looked at, you know, performance analysis, um, to support the, the coaching that I was doing. Uh, started coaching in the youth clubs here in, in, in the U.S. Um, and then sort of worked my way from that to the professional environment, starting from Philadelphia Union as a regional scout and also a IDP coach. Um, and then move from there to Charlotte uh, Football Club, another MLS uh, team in, in North Carolina, where I became the head of academy recruitment uh, right from the start when, you know, we, we joined the, the MLS. Um, and then the opportunity came for uh, me to join FIFA when uh, somebody informed me that, you know, Arsene is starting this project, uh, this global project, and they need some specialists in, in Africa to help support the member associations. So, you know, I put in my application, I uh, met, you know, everybody I was supposed to meet, do interviews, and uh, they offered me the opportunity. I'm not sure what they saw in me, but I was glad that opportunity was, was offered to me. And I've been working with, uh, with the FIFA on specifically on the African continent, uh, since 2021 now. Excellent. And, and really pleased to have you on. And obviously I need to mention a big thank you to Richard Allen, um, our, our joint colleagues. So, um, director of football at Loughborough, um, for putting us in contact and, and, and starting, starting this conversation. Um, Delaware, brief, brief background on me. I, um, I did some coaching, so used to go out to the States in university holidays and, and spent a longer holiday at the end of my university days coaching the football camps over there. Um, often did the East Coast, so done loads of places, Maine and Philadelphia and New Jersey, New York. Um, but we did sneak into Delaware um, because it is one of the smaller states, I think, and it was just to tick a box. So anyway, um, we could talk about that for hours, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We are we're here to talk about... <laughs> The African Cup of Nations, which is coming up soon, um, or the male, male game is. And we're going to look at the development of football in Africa. So I've been do, digging around and doing a bit of research. Um, and so African Cup of Nations for, for males started apparently in 1957 with only three teams. And it's now grown to 24 teams. So there's, it's growing, um, hosted every two years. And we can touch upon some of these things um, as we discuss things. The African Women's Cup of Nations began in 1991 and is also um, also every two years. And, and as we mentioned before, FIFA are looking all around the world to enhance the quality of, of football. Um, so that's the starting point, the African Cup, African Cup of Nations. With, with the Cup, African Cup of Nations and with development of football in Africa, what, what are the issues that you're facing in, in your role? Well, I think... Uh... That's a very good starting point. Um, and before this project started, uh, well, FIFA needed to understand what really goes on uh, when it comes to the development of talent, not only in Africa, but everywhere else in the world, in the global uh, uh, football space, I would say. Um, and the best way to do it is always to find, you know, do some sort of research to really understand how football is different in, in every region and every continent. Um, so we started with an ecosystem analysis, really just going into every uh, member association of FIFA, um, asking some questions about talent development. Um, you know, how do you find your talent? What environments do you have in place to, to grow this talent? What sort of competitions are available? Uh, who is involved in, in all these process and what are the systems in place? Um, and we were happy to have 205 member associations of FIFA uh, take part in this global research uh, uh, and ecosystem analysis, out of which we came up with some key findings, what really separates the top countries from you know, the, the rest of the 
of the world and what really are, you know, the, the things and the systems and process that goes on that separates the, the best from, from the rest. Um, and it was clear, you know, that the top 20, 25 countries are really doing a lot of things in common. And those are the differences that separates them from, you know, the rest of the countries that are below or outside, you know, 25, um, on, on the FIFA ranking there. Um, and a lot has to do with, you know, people, the quality of people that are in charge of these positions. Um, a lot with long term planning. Um, so people give themselves time and, and patience for this, you know, project to grow and others. They're just concerned about, you know, winning tomorrow and not just just in the future here. Yeah. Um, and of course, you can talk about infrastructure also. Um, and as I mentioned, the quality of people that are in charge of, of talent development in, in these countries. Uh, but some of the key things that we identified, these really are the areas also that we are supporting the MAs that have joined the program. Um, and I must say a very big thank you to you know, the top member associations in the world that have done this very, very well. They were happy and, and glad to open their doors for us to come inside and look at what they're doing and share all your knowledge and your practices. And we are able to take that and share with you know the other member associations that are not doing so well in those areas um, in just terms of the, those good practices, um, but also put them in touch so they can continue to share the, the knowledge and experience and the practices to help each other uh, get better in, in talent development. So those are where some of the key areas we identified. And these are the areas also that we have been contracted now to support, you know, the, the member associations that are not really doing well in those areas. Um, as our role as a specialist on, on the continent or on this project. So we'll touch upon some of those areas in a moment. But in, in terms of talent, there, there is a lot of talent in Africa because I was looking before and obviously we, we can know the, the household names like your Mo Salas and, and people like that at the moment. Yep. Um, but I think the research that I just looked at said that 7 percent of the premiership players are, are African. And that that um, that's probably probably about right with the African Cup of Nations, because I just looked before this and I think there's 31 players from the Premier League going to the African Cup of Nations. And yeah. unfortunately for me, six of them are Forest players. I'm a for I'm a Nottingham Forest fan, and six oh. of them are going. So uh, you know, I, I'm one of them typical Premier Premier League fans, really, because I'm going. Oh, the African Cup of Nations, it's getting in the way. We're losing loads of players, yeah. and and that seems to be the way that people respond to the African Cup of Nations in in the UK. Um, so could you give us just some insight into? why the African Cup of Nations is important for, for African football as, as a starting point? Yeah, no, I think what, what you just said there, Martin, uh, it's a bit of a challenge, even for the players themselves. You know, as much as they want to represent their, their countries, it's their pride, um, it's where they started. And for them, it's one way of giving back, um, making their, their country people happy by representing them at AFCON. Um, but it's a challenge for them. At the same time, they also have to be mindful because, look, you are contracted with these penalty clubs and that's where you really get your daily bread from. So it's a challenge for these players also to pick, you know, what do we do? Um, so I think it's, it's something that really needs to be, uh, uh, considered in the future as to what's best. If we really say the game is for the players and we take the players in the center of everything we do, then I think we have to think of it in that direction to make it easier for players to be able to, again, represent their, their countries, but also, you know, uh, play for their clubs because that's really where they, they earn their, their, their income from. Um, but for African people, Afghan is just more than a game. Afghan is, is a celebration of Africa, you know. I don't know if you've been around any African game, but you can look at the music, the entertainment, uh, the culture, the colorful events, people, the joy you see in the faces of people. It's just more than football for, for African people. Um, it brings us together. And if you throw a ball out there in an African community, it just brings everybody together. We forget about the whole problem. It's just like I said with you in the beginning when I was a kid. When we see football, our daily struggles were done. They never existed. But once the football is out and it's dark, now we go back and, and start thinking about those daily struggles. 
and it's the same for the African people. You know, it's just more than more than football. Um, and it represents a lot. And also, if you're talking about talent development in, in Africa as well, this is the flagship competition on the continent. You know, it's it's more than just just football for us. Um, and we look, you know, we look forward to to every edition of it. Um, but at some point, we have to sit down again and figure out the best way, uh, the best time to organize this without losing some of our best players. You know, because we want them to come down and compete. Um, some may not able to come because of injuries and some were, you know, we're done a situation right now. We just had, it's probably going to stay in United until the day before Cameroon opens up their game. That's when he's going to arrive in, in, in Abidjan, which for me is crazy. But again, if you're in that situation in my United where they need their best player to be there, it, it, you know, brings conversations like this. And some African people may not be excited about that, especially the Cameroonians. But you have to understand both environments that look, you know, United needs United now more than ever. Um, and Cameroon also needs now to compete. Um, and I'm sure Liverpool would love to have more Salah because again, they are on a good run. But again, these are all issues that uh, we have to have discussions about. But regardless of that, Afcon for us, African people, it's just more than a game. It's a celebration of Africa. It brings us together, and I think it's going to get better from from now. We'll, we'll again, we'll touch upon more of that because, as you said, it's it's the flagship, and and much of this funding, especially around probably the Ivory Coast and developments there, because that's where the tournament's being hosted. Um, we can talk about infrastructure and and how that might impact upon talent development. Having said that, around talent development. There is a lot of talent in Africa, as we talked about the Premier League. But even at that national level, it, it appears that in junior level football, the African nations do very, very well. So, again, some of my research, you know, suggests African nations are, are outperforming many others in that. Um, and it seems to get less as they get slightly older. So at under 17s, Nigeria have won the World Cup five times. Um, and then Ghana, you mentioned Ghana. So Ghana have won it twice. And then under 20s, Ghana have won it again. That's not progressed into the World Cup. We've had that age old question and I will ask you this later. You know, the age old question, when is an African team going to win the World Cup? It looks like there's an issue at the moment with transitioning from 17s, 20s to the, to the senior game. Is that one of the things that, you, that has been highlighted? And how do you think you might try and overcome that barrier? You're right. The transition of talent from youth, I would say development to senior, uh, is one of the most challenging areas, um, that we also, uh, saw during the ecosystem analysis, uh, back in 2020. Um, and that's an area that most African federations, I would say, have not really done possible. You know, um, we also go back and look at winning uh, there's, there's youth competitions and we can define winning in, in several ways. For some countries, winning means giving the opportunity for, you know, the best talented players, uh, at that time or the young ones, um, to go and compete and gain that experience. So when they grow, they would much, much prepare to compete in the senior stage. For others, winning at that level is finding your, you know, probably your most a physical or fast athlete that can dominate the youth at that age. But that necessarily doesn't mean those talented people are going to translate in the senior game in the future. And I think uh, for most African countries, they go for the second option where, okay, we can find the most fastest kid or the most physically strong kid to dominate you know, the kids at that age, which is normal because at that age, kids, you know, grow in, in different stages and the physically matured one at the early stages will dominate the ones that are less physically matured. Um, but that doesn't mean those physically matured players would translate to the senior stage at, uh, when everybody catches up in age. That seems to be a problem for, for many African countries. You know, when you identify in Thailand at a younger age, it's mostly the fastest kid. Um, you know, at, at that age. But now with us coming in in talent development, we are, you know, uh, sharing the knowledge and educating, uh, the scouts and coaches and federations that look, yes, right now, this kid who is the fastest and strongest may help you win at that youth stage. 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that when they grow and everybody catches up in maturity, they would continue to to be the best players there. So when identifying players into the best of environments, look beyond just the physical nature or the athletic side of of the player. You got to look at the player holistically, you know. And then if a player is small and may not be able to physically execute his decision at this age, at age 15 or 16, you still have to give this player an opportunity or put him in the best of environment or feed or prescribe this player with the best of medication to help him or her grow when they are older. And then they can be able to to compete and, and at that level. So that really seems to be a bigger problem. And as part of our uh, uh, job here now with working with member associations, we are educating uh, those federations more on, on those areas to understand talent ID as a holistic approach and not just what we see now, um, but rather think about the future, you know, so we are able to combine a bit of science when it comes to identifying the talent, but also science also when we are developing these players uh, in those developmental stages. Um, and that's part of our job here as uh, as a specialist working with African federations. It's, it sounds like one of those things that we've we've been kind of in Europe or England. We've we've, we've certainly been through that. Um, interestingly, my my undergrad dissertation, which when I've read it back is not very good, if I'm being honest, was um, <laughs> was a bat- was a battery of field tests on on football players in in an academy setting and in school settings, looking at that exact point that players were getting chosen. You know, the, the age old thing of going to the athletics track and picking like the fastest player was happening maybe 20 years ago. Um, and obviously, you're, you're kind of Barcelona type teams, your Lionel Messi's and yep. your you know, those kind of sides passing and, you know, a change in style of football has has potentially changed that. And it certainly has in the short term. I do wonder whether these things will go full cycle or not, whether it will be that kind of athleticism, performance and, and, and where that will go. So it's, it's an interesting space to look at. Um, and I do think yeah. that Barcelona team kind of have built that platform. But when I look at yeah. this and I, I look at what um, what Jose Mourinho did a little bit at, at Real Madrid, he just thought, well, I'm going to get physical then because I can't outplay you. I'm just going to out physical you. So it's an interesting yeah. dynamic, uh, but interesting that that's something that's that's, that's happening um, or, or you've perceived to be happening in, in, in Africa. I just I just want to slightly aside from the African Cup of Nations is. Um, the women's side of the game, because, again, in some of the research I looked at, it looks like the Nigerian women's side dominate in Africa. Um, and I just wonder whether that's been looked at, because from a competitive standpoint and spectator sp- standpoint, Nigeria, from what I've seen, have won um, the women's African Cup of Nations 11 times. And that's quite dominant. And I do wonder how the women's game is going in terms of com- competition, because as we know from from competition, the closer those competitions are, the better it is for spectators. That's the general idea. So have you picked up anything on the women's side of the game where to try and kind of level the playing field at all? Yeah, it's it's still an area that uh, needs a lot of development and investment, uh, uh, to be fair. Um, and you're right, Nigeria has done uh, very, very well on the women's side. Um, it used to be in a Nigeria, Ghana, mo- really the most, the West African countries, I would say, um, that really got into women football at a very early age. Um, it wasn't the case in, in Northeast or even in the, the Southern part of Africa. Um, but even still with that, I still think we are uh, behind, even in West Africa. Um, we can do so, so much better if there are more competitions or more opportunities for women to, to play the game. We are beginning to see that now, and it all comes from, from education. You know, I think back then, it wasn't a lot of education on women playing the sport, and it comes from, from the society and the culture we live in as well, because women really weren't permitted to do a lot of uh, this hard labor, I would say. Um, but now that's not the case, you know, and now that we are aware that, look, women can compete just as, as the men, um, we just have to provide a similar opportunity and platform just like we, we've done for the men and the boys, uh, for the women and the girls. And uh, uh, it's clear right now that um, we've got a long way to go, but it also shows that when we offer those opportunities and, and investment, 
uh, our men can do very, very well, just like we saw in, in the just ended Women's World Cup in New Zealand and, and in Australia with lots of upset. Um, Morocco just started women's football not long ago, and they would have thought they could go to a World Cup and compete against Brazil or Spain and, and still do well. It, it's just amazing, you know. So it's a bit sad that we are just getting into the game late now. And to be fair, women's football in general across, across the globe, uh, it's just picking up now. But uh, excited about the future of that. And uh, in Africa, we just we just need to catch up more, and, and we've got a lot of work work to do for sure uh, on, on the women's side of the game. And I'm, and I'm sure you will. And, and as nobody will be aware because they'll be listening to this, we're both on brand. Um, I've got my love for a background. You've got your FIFA background. And it says football unites the world in your background. And I think that's a really good point you just talked about there with the female side and how that's developed. It's the male side. Yeah. You spoke earlier about chuck a football out to, you know, you, you mentioned kids in Africa throw a football out and they'll all play. I mean, I, I coach my kids under eights. And they, they are like rabid dogs trying to get the balls yeah. out of the bag when I turn exactly. to training. It is the exactly. same around yeah. the world or certainly the environments we probably spend time in around football. So I, I just I just picked up on that and saw football unites the world. It really does. Can you give us some insights into what's being spent regarding infrastructure? So, yeah, can you give us some insight into what, what's happening in Africa? Maybe some maybe some case studies of specific things that you know of where that investment is in going and what type of impact it's, it may be starting to have. Yeah, so this uh, this is pertains to the, the FIFA Forward project, uh, which used to be, I think, a FIFA goal when, when it first started, and now it's FIFA Forward. Um, we are just about to start the 3.0 phase of it. Um, and you're right, you know, in, in Africa, a lot of uh, fans from, from FIFA Forward um, has come into infrastructure, and FIFA has three... Uh, say areas that when it comes to infrastructure, every member association should have in place. Uh, one being uh, headquarters where they can run the, the operations and in the growth of the game. Um, the second one being a training pitch that at least can, you know, bring the top talents together to, to train for, for competitions. And then the third one being a world class stadium to, to host, you know, a, a FIFA game, whether it's a friendly or a qualifying game, um, and this is where uh, most African countries are, are spending the FIFA Forward funds. Um, but what we've also realised now is the infrastructure is not enough. You know, it's like when you build a hospital, which is nice, beautiful, you still need the doctor to be there, uh, uh, you know, to, to work. And in many African countries, I think in the past thinking has been okay let's get the stadium let's get the training pitch let's get the headquarters and then everything else would be fine without paying too much attention or investing into uh what actually needs to be done in terms of the people that need to work and the service that needs to be offered to to the players and the talent to grow um that has been the missing link for for many years and i think it's also one reason why this talent development scheme that uh, FIFA just rolled out. Um, you can think of that more of the software part of it. If FIFA forward and infrastructure could be your hardware, now you need a software uh, 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 installed for this to be fully operational. And, and that's where we are now. Um, a lot has gone into the infrastructure. You can go to many places now where uh, there's a headquarters where you know the, the people are working. Uh, there is a stadium sometimes supported by, by the government um, or a training pitch where the, the national teams are, are, are training at in, in many African countries. But again, what's missing, as I shared with you, is just the quality of the people that work in these places and the kind of systems and processes that identify the best players um, and the patience needed uh, for this project to, to grow um, is what we, we've sort of brought on as part of the talent development scheme project and hopefully we believe if we bring this this two together if we marry the two together just like we've seen in many european countries um that is the recipe to to give every talent a chance and hopefully uh we can see much more potentials being maximized making the global uh, national teams much more competitive which is our goal uh, as part of this project
Uh, and where, where have you started? You mentioned the people. Just wondering where, where you started with this project. And, and it may well be different in different countries. So, I mean, we keep saying Africa and it's probably a ridiculous thing to be saying in, you know, we're talking, you know, in the context. Obviously, Africa is yeah. huge. So I don't know if you've got any specific countries where you can give us some more insight. But my, my main question really is around. Is this more of a kind of top down approach where you're improving at the elite level, the staffing and, and the coaching and the talent ID? Or are you talking, no, it's going to be more grassroots led? Because obviously in the UK and many European countries, you have that in infrastructure at different levels. And, you know, I would argue that our grassroots level in the UK is not is not as good as it should be. Um, and I don't know the numbers, but I do know that there's a lot less football coaches in the UK than there are in many European countries. So what's the approach that you've taken? Have you kind of gone for a let's get the top talent in place and, and kind of let it filter down? Or are you trying to hit grassroots and, and, and go up? Or is it a little bit of both? Uh, a little bit of both, Martin. I think we've taken a top-down approach, but also a bottom-up approach. Um, you can talk about elite football without talking about grassroots. You know, every top professional or high-performance uh, athlete started from grassroots. So that means um, before we get the best talent coming together uh, in the best of environments, we also have to make sure every kid, boy or girl, regardless of where he or she is born, has the opportunity to play the game or access to football first. So a good example you mentioned uh, uh, there, I would take South Africa, which is one of our um, MAs that's, that's in the program. Um, what we did in that project was start from the, uh, the, the provinces to make sure, okay, every boy or girl in that province has access to football. And from there, we can then start to filter out, okay, who are the ones with the, the top potential that we think maybe we can bring into the best of environments that could be a national team or an academy environment um, to grow and then hopefully move to represent uh, the, the South African national teams. So we start from the grassroots, football first, everyone has sex to it, put in a system and a process to identify these players. So what it is that we are looking for, um, and that has to be unique to, to the country. So in, if you go to South Africa again, what's, what is the culture? What does football look like there? Um, with other people, you know, we, we take into consideration all of that. And for me, that's a uniqueness in this program that every country we go to is not a cookie cutter approach where we are copying an England DNA into a South African DNA or a Ghanaian DNA because we think England is doing very well. That's not the case. That we'll look at some of the best practices or the good practices that England has done in the past couple of years and see if we can adapt that to to every MA and make it unique and specific to, to, to every MA here. So again, the grassroots are important. Every kid, boy or girl, have a sex of the game, out of which we can then say, okay, maybe this A or B has got the potential to maybe move on into the best of environments that could be an academy. So then the next stage would be, okay, can we set up one or many high performance environments in this country where the top talents can then be moved into these environments for future development. We do have uh, one other program where the FIFA talent coach um, also operating in 25 countries now where FIFA has sent a uh, coach into these countries to serve as a guide for the member association. So this coach is bringing some of the best practices that we've seen in the global stage into these MAs, using science as a way of developing the players or identifying the players, but sharing these practices for the coaches in this MA. Hopefully they can then learn from these good practices and then apply, and yeah, apply them in their own environment to develop the best of talents that they've found. And then the next stage would be often opportunities to compete. So many African countries at U17, it's the first time they come in contact with international uh, competition. A lot of them also don't have access to quality education until they get to the age of 18 or 19. So if you look at ages from 9 to 16, there's a lot missing there, you know. So um, us sending a coach into this 
uh, uh, member associations to to work with them, not necessarily to be the coach, but also help be a guide. They can bounce off ideas because our coaches from FIFA have access to some of these global practices, the global games, so they can then share this as benchmark um, to help support the environment uh, in, in these member associations, which is the academy you know piece of it. Um, our goal is to have at least one academy in every uh, member association by 2026 or a place where you call a talent factory, where the best talents are being identified, brought into the environment and holistically being developed um, to to represent their countries or also be good citizens. You know, we, do, we do know not, not all of them would, would represent their countries when they are older, but at least we are providing that holistic education in, in those academies with our coaches on the ground, um, being a guide, you know, helping them, showing them these good practices. Um, so that way they can, again, create the best of environment for this place at a younger age before coming to age 17 when they get, you know, close contact with, uh, with the FIFA competition. Um, so this really is, is, is all part of the, the package that FIFA is offering to, to the member associations. And we do understand that it may not be for everybody. You know, for some member associations, we got to go back to the grassroots first, make sure the game is accessible in every country before we move to the second piece of it, which is, you know, this, this program that we are offering. And for some others also, we think the game is already established where many kids have access. But now we have to move to the elite level where the best players are identified across the country and then brought into this high performance environment with you know, the quality people, uh, good people in charge, offering them the best of opportunities and education to grow and hopefully move to U17 where they can represent the countries or move on uh, to, to professional clubs. And there was a lot of lots of things in there that you, you've spoken about, yeah. one of them being bringing in experts, really, who are going to help facilitate the development of people and development of coaches and, and scouting networks and things like that. I presume for each country, you, you know, you have a plan for that country. And you mentioned each country having one talent centre as, as a goal. Do you yeah. have goals around the the coaching infrastructure? So do you. Do you want a thousand more coaches, for example? Is, are, are there goals around that? Or do you want coaches at different levels? Or do you not have those kind of things in place? We do. The whole project starts with every country, first of all, putting in place a long term strategic plan. You know, so we look at the number of kids uh, enrolled um, in football in the country. Um, some countries have it, some don't. Um, and we do think it's important to understand, you know, how many kids are actually playing a game in a grassroots level. Um, you can then start to compare, okay, how many are dropping out? At what age are they dropping out? What are the reasons why they are dropping out? And again, we got to come up with solutions to 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 fix this 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 problems. Um, and that leads to the coaches that are in charge of of uh, of this players and also the the level of education. Um, that you have access to. So we, we support in that as well. Um, that goes into this long-term strategic plan. So if you're working with you know, a thousand kids in the country, who are the coaches? What's the level? Um, what's the coach player ratio? We'll look at all that as, as part of the long-term plan. If there is a need to upscale, uh, this, this key roles within the MA in terms of coach education or you know, performance analysis, psychology, all these, you know, multidisciplinary areas that support the development of, of a player. We support in all of that. And that's that's part of the consultancy that we offer to the member association. Um, we can also bring in, you know, member associations that have done very, very well in what we call a knowledge exchange, um, where we can bring in England if they happen to, to be in the program. Uh, to sit down with, you know, a country from Africa, whether it's Ghana, South Africa, Nigeria, and just share good, good practices, you know, and as I mentioned earlier on, the top countries, uh, are all in this. Um, and a big thank you to them because they could have easily said, look, we don't want to do this because we already went in everything. Why should we open up and, you know, uh, make ourselves more vulnerable or get competitive? But that's not the case, you know, they were, 
happily to be involved in the program because for them also, they need to learn. They can't get complacent. Yeah. You know, you need to understand what the changes and what's coming so they can prepare themselves better. So I think from that aspect, they were happily to, to come on board and, you know, the, the smaller countries can also learn from them. Um, and what we are doing, which for me is the strongest pillar in, in this project that we are working on. The fact that we can connect, you know, a country that's 60 or 70 in the FIFA ranking to a top five to share ideas, um, learn from each other and grow. I think it's an awesome thing. It makes football a lot better. It increases the competitiveness of our game because, of course, we want to keep football as the number one sport in the world. And we have to continue to evolve. And the game itself continues to evolve. And these are some of the things that we have to do behind the scenes to make sure it remains competitive. Um, but most importantly, that the game continues to to grow and make it accessible to, to every country that really wants to play. It's really interesting because I speak to many people in different fields as well. And there has been occasions, I think history will tell us, that people sometimes close the doors and, and development doesn't happen. And when you open your doors and you have these conversations, whether you're sat at the top yeah. of the tree or at the bottom, it's beneficial to everybody. And I do think those at the top are more susceptible to say we're not sharing anything. But actually, people seem a bit more educated now to go, do you know what? Actually, us sharing that will actually help yeah. us as well. Um, and yeah. often when you get some of these people that I can clearly see you're passionate about football, they want to share it because it's football and they yeah. want to share it. And it's the same for people I see in other sports or other areas where you want to share because you want to help. And that, that fundamentally drives a lot of people. So you're going to get yeah. some of the best people sharing some of the best thing for the benefit of all. And it really does, you know, football unites us in, in everything, as we've as I've mentioned. Um, one of the things you mentioned, exactly. if we go back to the pathway, is that. You, you, I really like the way you talked about hardware and the infrastructure and now developing the software. And we know that these kind of things take, you know, 10 years as a minimum should be these kind of plans of, of where you're going to get some development. But you've gone on this path when you've talked about development, development, get to this elite academy within Africa. And you and I are probably both aware that a lot of African players want to leave Africa. And some of this might be because these things aren't in place and they see other places. So Europe. Um, I believe this has happened where other countries may have 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 money and may have recruited African players. So this this has happened in other places, not just Europe as well. And often they've these players have gone on a journey when some of the African players are leaving Africa, maybe going to Europe, is that when they don't make it as professional footballers, they haven't got a flight home to Africa. And there's you know, there's there's huge potential problems around that. So. Have you started to do anything to kind of address those issues ar around that? Or is this a case of we're going to develop the infrastructure and the software and the coaching to enhance performance and practice and potentially financial gain within Africa? And that may stop this kind of thing happening. Does that question make sense? I know it's long winded there. It does. It does. I think uh, this is bigger than just football. If you take football out. You know, for a sec. Um, and if you look at the underdeveloped countries uh, in the world, a lot of people in those uh, countries would really want to, you know, go somewhere else and, and you know, where there is better uh, opportunities and, and way of living. It's going to happen, you know, um, whether football is still in existence or not. Um, but you're right at the moment. And again, I can see maybe for the next five years, you still want to want the top talents, want to move to the best of environments. And that's what really is attracting them. It's the environment, you know. Um, do we see African uh, leagues and, and, and the continent itself get into that stage? Yes, it takes time. It takes a lot of investment as well. Um, but that's, for me, another challenge that's bigger than, than just football. You know, football... Yeah can't solve everything, you know. Um, people find that it's an easy way to to make, you know, the big bags and, and feed their families and themselves because there's a lot of money in football, which is true, um, which is why you find a lot of players from Africa going through that, that route. Um, but for us to be able to stop that, we, for a second, we have to think outside football, you know, what it is that people are actually looking for. You know, because football is just 
for a, foot, a footballer, you're looking at maybe what 10, 15 years if you're lucky. You still have lots of years to live outside of football, you know. So football can play a role here yeah, in terms of educating uh, these little kids as to what decisions to make. Um, but I also do think for us to get to the level where we retain our top talent here, we really have to improve in a lot of areas. Um, infrastructure is one. Uh, the development of the football is another area. Uh, commercializing our game here is, is, is another area as well. But I think the bigger picture for me is, is more than just football. It's what goes on in our society and the communities we live in is what can bring uh, a halt to, to some of these, these challenges and the problems we face. Football is got its role to play for sure. But if you really want to bring this to, to a halt, we have to look beyond football and start looking into every, you know, economy in every country and see how best we can make the people that live their, their lives better, um, offer more opportunities. Um, and if that happens, a lot of talents, but I think football also at football will look to, to stay because really these people are looking for happiness and comfort. And if we can offer that in our, you know, countries in, in, in Africa, I don't think a lot would even you know, want to go outside and, and go through lots of challenges um, um, to get there. So uh, it's a global challenge for us, but hopefully football can can help solve it. But I also think we got to look beyond just just football here. Yeah, I, I think you make excellent points on everything you've just raised. I know, I think it was Mario Balotelli was famous for saying all as African players should put our money together and go back to Africa and develop the youth and develop all the football um with it within Africa. Um and and I know, you know, we're not touching on it in detail, but I know we have done a lot of research um from from Loughborough around that. So I know Carolyn Mason and, and Sir Hat Yilmaz and others have looked at um I know they've got paper on I've, I've got it down here. So rights, risks and responsibilities in the recruitment of children within global football is one of their research papers. So anyone who's interested in, in that side, I wanted to touch upon it briefly here. But if you're interested in that yeah. side, I'll, I'll probably try and get those people on to talk about the depth of, of those challenges yeah. you're touching on there. That's, be awesome. that's not just football. It's, it's wider and it's, it's, it's exactly. legislation, exactly. it's law, it's, it's those kind of things. Yeah. If, if you look there, Martin, the, the, the number of people that actually move outside, um, through football, it's a small percentage. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not a lot. It's very, very small, mind you. There are still people outside football that are going through a lot to get to 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 this, you know, comfortable and and environments that can offer more opportunity. We got to think about them as well, you know. So, yeah. which is why I keep saying football is is only a small piece of it. We hear a lot of stories around football because, of course, football is is the number one sport in the world, and people just look at that. But there are a lot more that are going through these challenges outside football. And for me, that's where the majority is. And that's where we got to look at in the bigger picture and not just, just focus on, on the football only. Um, and it's a global challenge, you know, and, and we all have to come together and, and find the best ways, uh, to, to, to bring a heart to this because, you know, we are losing lots of lives, uh, through, through this. Totally, totally agree with everything you said there. And like I said, we'll focus on that in, in another podcast. We're going to we're going to start drawing to a close fairly soon. So I did want to kind of just hit you with a few more, probably slightly more quick fire questions. Um, one of them would be, what, what do you think the future holds for football in, in Africa? So where, where are we? You've talked about what you're trying to do, but what, where's the where's the future? Where, where would you like to be in 10 years time with, with these projects? To see a Morocco. Or a country like, you know, a story like Morocco happening at every single edition of every tournament. For us, it's what we want to see. And it's not just in Africa, but from Konkaka, from Asia, from Conmebol, um, you know, UEFA, they've, they've done very well if you look at the tournament. But for us, if we are able to say, okay, the next 48 countries that are going to the World Cup in US and Mexico, Canada, each one has a chance to win the trophy. It makes the game much more competitive. It raises the commercial value of the game. And we can then invest more from that into the development of, of football uh, 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 in the world. That for us would be a huge achievement. 
so a few more quick fire questions um because that would be a huge achievement and linked to that who who are the nations who are driving this forward at the moment is it you know give us one of the bigger nations potentially who who may be already doing this well is there any underlying kind of nation we think do you know what they're they're onto the right lines here they're going to do this well are there any of those around i think you you can look at the past editions of the world cup you know the you know there are some teams that have been very very consistent you know they've have been to the past maybe what four or five editions not just there but they also at least get to the final stages of the competition uh these are your countries that are doing very very well um and then there are others that pop you know in and out you know they're coming this year and then the next edition they're out um they lack that bit of consistency and that's what we are looking to bring uh when it comes to high performance not just one time but every single time you know doing the right things at the right time for a long period of time is what we are looking to to instill in in these countries um but if you look at again the the past editions of, of fifa competitions it's easy to tell the ones that are always there and doing well into the final stages and then the ones that come in you know and compete do well and then they fall off after two or three editions and then back in again we want those guys to go there every single edition and again not just be there but progress to to the final stages and not just have those few that always get to you know the final four or the final 16 of, of the, it's very clear if you look at the people one case you can you can tell that and are there, are there any countries at the moment that that may have not qualified for the world cups and you think do you know what they're going to get there because they're doing things well is there is there somebody we could go Everybody out there might be really surprised, but there's a couple that, you know, are there underlying putting these principles in place. If I go to Africa, I would pick Mali as one country that I think, again, if you look at the youth, they're doing very well. Every edition, you're there, but not really quite in the senior competition yet. So we are waiting to see when it's, you know, I think this could be the, the, the time for them. Um, because they've sort of been consistent in Africa in, in the past couple of years, in youth and then senior. I do believe this is a country that if I have to pick tomorrow and say, okay, we've sort of built a system that's producing lots of young talent now and it's been consistent in the past couple of years. Now it's time to break into the, the senior competition. And if they're able to do that and continue to do what they are doing in the youth stages, I think they will be consistent in not just the youth tournament, but also the senior competition. Mali for me, uh, sounds like they are, they are, they are getting closer. Okay. We're going to, we're going to test a bit more, more of your knowledge or your, your experience here then. And we'll hold you to account once this is released. It's out there. So a couple of final kind of finishing <laughs> questions. First one, African Cup of Nations. Who's going to win it? I'm going to give you two, two answers. Okay. Here, it's okay. Yeah, I'm going to give you my bias one, okay, because I'm from Ghana, so it's easy <laughs> to say Ghana is going to win it. That's my bias opinion. Then I'll give you what I think uh, could be potentials, again, based on the consistency, based on, you know, performance in the past couple of years, based on experience, and also based on balance on, on their team. Senegal is a favorite. Uh, I think it's easy. Uh, Morocco is another one. Again, I think we can all agree to that because they've been very consistent and, you know, what they did in the World Cup. Now we're looking for more. Um, but the war as a host nation, uh, could, could favor them. Uh, Egypt is always a favorite. They are in the most, you know, one of the most, uh, Afghans on, on the continent and they continue to produce, uh, uh, talent. So I think they, they, they are there. This four for me, I would say, uh, really have the chance of winning. And then you have the rest that are, you know, can, can spring a surprise, like Ghana, Nigeria, Tunisia. Uh, you, you, you've really hedged your bets here. You know, if you do get this wrong, <laughs> if a country wins it that you've not mentioned, then you're in trouble because you mentioned about <laughs> six, six or seven there. De- know, a, a, a deeper, a deeper question then. Who's going to be the first African nation to win the World Cup? You can't say you can't say you can't say Ghana. 
<laughs> we'll say Ghana already, but give it one, one, one other than Ghana. I think one of the first four I mentioned could, you know what, maybe not. They could all win it. They could all win it, Martin. It's, they're not far off at all. <laughs> Yeah, you're not you're not you're not willing to go. You're not willing to go. What what about women? What about women's football? Would it if it was a women's team from 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 Africa? Would it be Nigeria? Would they be the one who? Would Nigeria is, is is the most close yet, so it's easier to say Nigeria. Uh, they've been to every single edition on the women's side. Um, however, if you look at what we saw from Morocco, from Zambia, from South Africa, I wouldn't be surprised if you know one of them. Uh, surpasses Nigeria. But if you have to pick one now, you would say Nigeria because they've been to every single edition and they've, you know, they've, they've, they've shown us that they can really compete uh, on that side. I think an African women team would probably win the World Cup first before men's team. You answered my question before I asked it. I, that was my next and final question. So a, women, yeah. a women's African team will win it before a male team. I like I that. So. And, 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 I, and I think we'll, we'll finish on that. And um, Abdul Faisal, I really enjoyed talking to you. It's been good to kind of be good to get an overview of FIFA and what they're doing around the world to develop these 50 nations that could be competitive for a World Cup and to get some insights in in how you're kind of trying to implement things in in Africa um, throughout these nations. I really like the simplistic way that you put the hardware has been developed yeah. or being still being developed in terms of the infrastructure and stadiums and headquarters and all those kind of operational sides of things. So you've got the facilities to do this. And now that you're digging into the software side, the coaches, the yeah. talent development at grassroots level, developing these academies, ideally across all partner countries um, and how football unites the world. I think that's definitely the context of this in that you've got these elite nations working with developing nations and everybody's trying to plug together to make something great happen within football. Um, I've really enjoyed chatting to you. And I really hope we can chat in the future, um, maybe, maybe in a few years time when um, maybe the Nigerian women's team win or maybe Ghana win something <laughs> potentially, yeah, or, you know, or, or, in the, or in 10 years time. Yeah, if Ghana wins something, yeah. we'll definitely get you back on. <laughs> or in yeah, 10 years time yeah. when some of these developments are really happening and African yeah. football has, has grown massively and they are competitive more often and more consistently. It would be brilliant to see. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Martin. I uh, enjoyed the chat. And uh, again, thanks for all the wonderful work you guys do to, to help develop our game. Um, and I look forward to, to returning back for another uh, discussion on, on our football. Thanks for listening to the Experts in Sport podcast. If you'd like to get in touch, then please contact me, Martin Foster, at m.foster at Thanks for listening. See you next time.